Netherlands. It's an honor for me to introduce Fredrik Rundqvist for Massive, Massive Entertainment. Would I cry till tomorrow? Would I keep the non-believers away? Remember the late night in last September when you held me in your arms so tight? I was Hello. Hello. First of all, Fredrik, why did you walk on stage to erase your song? Uh, I love you for playing that for me. It's, it's a band I actually used to work with. I don't know if that's why, but uh, um, there's an amazing start. Mm. Uh, when you are in a situation that we described before, uh, when it's so stressful, how do you perform? How do you, how do you feel in that kind of situation? Well, I think, I, uh, I think nobody wants to be there in a very stressful situation, but I, I really thrive under stress. I, uh, I think I do some of my best performance when I'm under stress. Okay. So this is a piece of cake for you then? Uh, not really. I wish it was fewer people, but... <laughs> the stage is yours, Fredrik. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Fredrik Unqvist. I'm executive producer on a AAA game called The Division. Uh, I work for Massive uh, Ubisoft here in Malmö. And we've been producing this game for many years now. Uh, it could potentially be the biggest entertainment project that was ever produced in Sweden or in Scandinavia. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about some of the straightforward um, findings uh, scaling up from basically just 10, 20 people all the way up to several hundred people working on this over three different time zones. Um, 1978 is the year I officially became geek. This was my first uh, home video system. I was seven years old and it was very unusual back, back, back in those days. Uh, I don't know if there is anyone in the audience that still remembers this uh, fantastic machine. Uh, as my, um, the level of hormone increased in my body, so did the interest for music. And I was kind of hijacked uh, by the music industry for uh, about 15 years. But uh, I, uh, was it now, seven, eight years ago, eight years ago, I returned to the uh, gaming industry. Uh, and as I said earlier, I work for uh, a company called Massive here in Malmö. Uh, when we started out uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, we just got acquired by Ubisoft, who uh, is the third biggest publisher in the world, game publisher. So they have around 10,000 people in the world developing games, and roughly 400 of those produce games here in Malmö. Uh, we've been working on three titles so far during the last uh, seven years. Far Cry 3, which is one of my favorite brands. Of course, the flagship title, Assassin's Creed, and then The Division. Uh, that I've been working with over the last couple of years. Um, this wonderful image here from South Park is pretty much how people saw gamers a couple of years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, not so much anymore. This image here is from a uh, e-commerce event. Uh, and I don't know how closely you follow this, but uh, they basically fill big sports stadiums with fans watching different uh, video games being played. Uh, and the combined prize money of the top five uh, tournaments for games is $100 million. So uh, it might not be such a big deal if your kids spend most of their time playing games. There might be a big pot of money in the end. Uh, there's been a lot of talk here uh, the last uh, today and yesterday about a company in Stockholm called King being sold to um, Activision for an incredible $5.9 billion. To put that in perspective, it's more money than what uh, Disney paid for the entire Star Wars franchise a couple of years ago, or even four times more than uh, what was paid for Volvo cars. So um, it is indeed a, uh, a different industry than it was uh, four decades ago. 
So uh, the total global turnover for, for our industry is roughly $100 billion. Um, we estimate that roughly 1.2 billion uh, people in the world are playing games. Um, this wasn't the case when I started to play games, obviously. It was, uh, over a long time, it was con considered um, a male thing. Uh, but I'm really happy to see that it, we're starting to um, attract almost as many women as we do men, even though they have very different patterns when they, how they behave and what they, what they do in the games. Um, uh, and also, uh, Sweden is a superpower when it comes to gaming. Uh, some of the absolutely biggest games in the world uh, is coming from Sweden. Uh, Candy Crush that I just mentioned from King. Uh, Minecraft that many of you know. We also have a, a great company in Stockholm called DICE who do the Battlefield series and they're also launching their first Star Wars game uh, later this year. And of course, uh, all the games that we work on. Uh, another, a perspective that we used to take uh, developing games is that it's uh, essentially a battle for people's time. Um, people, young people, uh, they spend an incredible four hours a day online. Uh, and 6.3 hours of those are spent uh, on gaming. So that accumulates to around uh, 3 billion hours of, of uh, playing games a week. Um, and of course, the first step to convert those players uh, into our business model, into our um, into paying customers is obviously to get them to, to play our games in the first place. So that's why we kind of uh, use, use the perspective of, of the, the, the battle for people's time. You need to convert uh, first and foremost uh, people uh, to your, your category of, uh, of online activities. So creating a unique universe, um, it's, a, it's a tall order. It doesn't have to be as grand uh, as creating a, a, creating a universe itself. It's simply a place where people like to hang out. Uh, it's a game world, it can be uh, obviously uh, a website, uh, a book, a movie, whatever. But th to win the people for battle's time, you need, to, you need to create a place where people like to hang out. Um, in an in a incredibly large product that, like this, and I think it, it goes for um, basically from the smallest type of company to the, to the biggest one, is um, hire for passion. I think that's very, very important. Uh, skilled people, uh, obviously you need skilled people, but if you can't convert the people that work for you to be your, your primary ambassadors for your brand, for your vision, for your products, um, then you can never truly create that unique space that you need to win the battle for time. Comprehensive research, uh, it's a given for most of you. Uh, you all work uh, in the online uh, field and nothing I think is easier these days than to, to go online and, and uh, research and check out all the things that are available for free in the public domain. Um, when, we, when you do video games, uh, and we do, um, the division is partly a very violent video game, and many of us have has no idea how, how, how this happens. So we actually spend a lot of time uh, with um, military guys, following them in the field, how do they use their weapons, um, what, what does it sound like? Um, of course, uh, we also talk to um, ex-CIA, um, you know, anyone who we, who we feel has a good, good experience to share. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about A-B testing here tonight. Uh, we obviously do that as well, but I think uh, there is one step uh, that you can do before that. Um, we, um, obviously, you need that first spark. You need that uh, intuition to, to start your idea, to kick off your company to start with. But um, very soon afterwards, <clears throat> we start to focus test and we focus test very regularly. So in a project that's been running now for 
many years, we still do a consumer focus test every second week. So we invite eight people uh, to join our studio um, and it can be testing simple functionality to do an overall appreciation test. Uh, and there's um, a good friend's dad who's actually a professor in statistics. He told me that if you can just manage to find eight people of, of, the demo of your demographic, of your target group, you will essentially get all the major findings, all the major concerns for your product or your service by testing with those eight people. You won't get the edge cases, you won't get all the nuances, but essentially if you test with eight people or a thousand people, you're going to get the same results. So I think this is something that anyone can do uh, as long as you're, you're certain of, uh, of your target group. Um, also technology. A lot of people here, I, I assume, are dependent on technology to create or provide the service or the product uh, of your company. Uh, we, as game developers, we are certainly um, very dependent on our technology. Uh, I think to be able to create that unique experience, to, to be able to create that uh, feeling of um, immersion, uh, you really need uh, to, to control your own technology. You need to embrace it. You, I, I used to say you need to embrace failure. You need to allow for R&D, you need to, to have fun and experiment with your tech. I think only then you will be able to, to de develop and, and find all those interesting um, little functionalities that will give you an edge against competition. So, uh, I put together a video uh, where we're interviewing a couple of my colleagues internally. Uh, people who have been developing our own tech, we call it the Snowdrop Engine. I think it's one of the first game engines out there that are specifically designed ground up to take full advantage of the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. Um, let's take a look. We wanted to create an engine that was capable of creating truly next generation of AAA games. But we also saw that as games were getting bigger, so were the projects working on them. And we wanted to go better, not bigger. And we all wanted to be smart and not rely on brute force. The engine should also support how we work in the studio, which is a lot of quick iterations on features, have a lot of creativity and the freedom to experiment and prototype. The core of the Snowdrop engine is a node-based scripting system. This is really the beating heart of the engine that allows us to do what we do. It affects all systems of the engine, from rendering to AI to mission scripting and the UI. It allows us to quickly develop our assets and to preview them and interact with them in ways that have never been done before in the industry. It's so easy to use and to set up that you really have the freedom and the time to explore different options. The editor is basically just a set of different windows that you can move around whatever you want. And if you work in a specific way, you can adjust the editor to fit your needs. Working with the engine is kind of like solving a puzzle because the components are usually already there. It's just a matter of how you combine them together. You can do whatever you want. It's basically it's like Lego because it's just different building blocks and you can test, does this fit here, more or less. You can make some really cool results just by very simple components. I really enjoy to work with it. At Massive, I would call our work style a form of hectic fun. We're very busy all the time and we, we like to use our talents to really uh, try to make the best product that we can. All right, the store was empty. I heard that gunfire. There's always that chance of somebody's eyes glazing over and they realizing, but what if we do this? And th that person runs out and comes back with this fantastic idea that somebody hasn't tried before. We're really creating something new and unique together. 
with this power and with the usability in the tools, we saw that people really excelled in what they created. We got amazing graphics, we got new features, and we got unique innovations that we didn't expect, but that really pushed Endian forward. And all this was thanks to the foundation that the Endian and the tools supplied. Between the philosophy of our company and the power of our technology, what we've achieved is to empower our artists to really achieve levels of quality never before seen. So back in the days when we were acquired by Ubisoft, we got a very exciting mandate from, from the new owners. Um, creating a new IP or creating a new intellectual property or creating a new franchise. Um, they, you might, re some of you guys in the audience, have you heard of Tom Clancy? Raise your hand if you know who he is. Quite a few. Uh, these are three very famous movies from the 1990s, um, and they were all based on books from the 1980s. And if you, if you went to an airport or a bookstore back in the 1980s, you would see that he would top the charts. Whatever he put out, he was always there at the top of the charts. Um, and early 2000, Ubisoft acquired the Tom Clancy license, basically to develop and release games under the name Tom Clancy, derived from the books and from the movies. Um, and it's been a very successful pillar of the company. We sold uh, 76 million games up until now, not counting The Division, that's not out yet. Um, and of course, when, when, when they came to us and say, hey you guys, we need a role-playing game, we don't have an RPG game uh, at Ubisoft, we need to breathe some new life into Tom Clancy, uh, young people don't really understand what it is, they don't care about the brand anymore. Uh, we need to modernize it a little bit, we need to um, energize it. Uh, we started to think about um, looking back at the older Clancy books, it was always, it was the fear of the Cold War. It was the nuclear winter, it was KGB fighting the CIA. Um, and how do you transform that into something that's relevant for the kids today? And we started to look at the in environment, environmental threats and, uh, of course, the fear of the great pandemic. And if you look at a video game, the environmental threats, it's hard to depict in a game because of the timeline. Uh, what we decided to do was to investigate what happens if an engineered virus is released in the modern society uh, and things start to break down. And the fact is, when the, the more we started to research it, this, the more scary it got. For example, how many people here would know where you would find your fresh water if the tap stopped working tomorrow? Okay, I see one hand. Uh, so what if your uh, local grocery store, who don't stock more than two, three days worth of food, where will you get your food if you don't get it at IKEA? I see another hand. So, uh, obviously, um, this was kind of a different spin on Tom Clancy. Uh, up until then, he always succeeded to stop the terrorist uh, just before he blew up the bomb or before, he, uh, before the plot unfolded. Uh, so, our game basically takes place in, uh, in a world where the terrorists succeeded in releasing a virus and society start collapsing around you. Uh, again, I like to em emphasize this. Emphasize this. Uh, research, be the expert of whatever you're creating. Uh, if you have the passion, if you have enough passionate people, uh, this will be uh, a no-brainer. Everybody will do it uh, on, by themselves, so to speak. For us, it was super exciting. The, the game takes place in New York City. Uh, we spoke to the city of New York, NYPD, uh, U.S. Army, etc., and they were all more than willing to share all the information they have about uh, evacuating 
such an incredibly big city, uh, a city with a bigger population population than in, than entire Sweden. Um, one of the one of the things they told me that I, that I thought was very exciting uh, was, um, uh, for example, they, New York City is such a such a location that you have, uh, and you have people live in so small apartments. Everybody wants to go to New York City uh, and visit friends, so they all have inflatable mattresses. Uh, so one of the problems that they have if they try to quarantine off New York City is people will take those inflatable mattresses and simply float off the island. So they are practicing, they are target practicing on how to take out those inflatable mattresses if they ever need to quarantine New York. So all of these crazy stories, uh, you know, can make into wonderful fiction uh, into a game or a movie or a book. Uh, believable, you need a sense of urgency. For us it was important to uh, have a, uh, a fast unfolding event, you know, old society crashing in a couple of weeks, makes a very good play field for a game. Relatable contrast, uh, a war zone is not super exciting to me. What's super exciting is if you take Madison Square Garden subway station and you turn it into a morgue, then people understand that there's something terribly wrong uh, with what's going on. Um, I have, if you, now that you listen to what I say, I'm going to show you guys, uh, to what I said, I'm going to show you guys another movie, and uh, you'll be the judge if we succeeded in uh, and bringing back some, some fear into uh, what a possible scenario like this could, could bring. You'll be the judge. Silent night, holy night, all is gone. It's hard to watch something you love destroy itself, to see it fall apart. Disaster always feels so distant, detached, someone else's struggle in some faraway place. It's not until it's in our city, at our doors, that we realize how fragile we are. All of us. All of this. No, baby.
As an agent of the division, your job is to take the city back, to help all the people left in the quarantine city and uh, retake it from all those people taking advantage of this situation. That's all I had. Thank you very much for listening. I can't wrap my mind around how you can create things like that. It's just amazing. Mikael and Conley, do you have any questions? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I think that just if, if you want to share something, Fredrik, on, on your personal opinion on looking at what e-commerce is, is going through now, um, kind of doing the same battles about finding the customer love and, and the retention and getting them to, to stay loyal, but also the discussion about gamification that is ongoing. Uh, how much should e-commerce people actually start to listen and learn from the fantastic efforts that you guys put into the experiences and, and building customer loyalty? I think the, I mean, obviously I'm not the expert on e-commerce, but if there are two things as, from a consumer perspective that I would uh, carefully look at, one of them is the, uh, um, that, that there was another guy talking about it earlier today, is the community. Like we, uh, we spend so much time speaking to every single person who want to interact with us. Uh, and we have, you know, people uh, spending time and working on trying to convert all those people into ambassadors for our brand, uh, for our products. Uh, I th and I think, I think e-commerce can, can take a good look at what the games industry has been doing there. Uh, the second one is what I, what I briefly talked about in my presentation is trying to create something that's more than just a shopping experience. Uh, creating a, a, unique, a unique place that people like to hang out. So, uh, you know, eventually uh, price will be kind of a neutral uh, selling point. Uh, technology will be a neutral selling point. You need to understand what other dimensions you could add to create that space where people want to spend their online time. There's a huge trend that where e-commerce uh, companies actually hire people from the, the gaming world. What do you think about that? I think it's great. I think everybody should do that. Mm. So, Frederick, my last question. You, you're, you're actually quitting. You decide to quit Massive. Yeah, so... So what's next? What's next? Well, first of all, I want to say I, I worked uh, many years with this one project. And the game is... I, I say it's done. I have people who would kill me say it's done. There's still a couple of months worth mm. of, of uh, optimization and tech work. But the, the game is kind of done. Mm. Uh, and it's time for me to, to look at doing something new. Uh, and I'm super happy to be part of uh, Magnus' new team to try and make his uh, vision about City On become a reality. So Fantastic. that's where I'm going. So, Frederick, welcome to the new world. Thank you <laughs> for very you, much. The real Thank world. You. Thank you so a big much. Big hug. Thank you. <laughs> a big, big applause for Frederick. I know that you love me. <laughs> <laughs>